Hey everyone, welcome to the Let's Be Real podcast. I'm Nain, your host for this episode, and today we'll be discussing the Civil War box office results so far. Questionable, quick fire questions, a beloved segment from James's podcast, and our top 10 DreamWorks animation films. So, that's James right there. He just waved to you before. And we might as well jump straight into this. So sit back, don't open a cold one yet, wait till the dream works, and then that's when you open your cold one, and let's get into it. All right. Civil War has taken the world by storm, both negatively and positively. <laughs> um, and right now it is a gem for A24. It is the high, It is the highest opening A24 film ever with 10.7 million on the opening day, including preview screenings, and it's predicted to make around $26 million. I believe the highest grossing weekend has been Hereditary, Mm -hmm. and it's on track to absolutely smash it. So, James, what do you take from this? Um, Well, it's great for A24. You know, they said that they want to get into, like, bigger films um, that kind of make a little bit more money. So I guess this is a starting point from them. And it makes complete complete sense. It's their highest budgeted movie um, by a decent amount. I think it made, I think it was budgeted at fifty million, and the last one was Bo is Afraid at thirty five million. Um, except for with Bo is Afraid, it made eleven million worldwide um, compared to its massive budget of thirty five million. So, yeah, great news for A twenty four here. Civil War looks like it will pay off. It will return. Um, a profit, I would presume so at least. It really depends on the international box office at the end of the day for this one. The only thing that I have worrying is that, sure, it's going to have a great opening weekend. In fact, if it is projected to be 26 million, it will jump into the top 10 A24 movies domestically. Total. Not weekends, just total. Uh, which is just insane. Uh, to just immediately jump into the top 10. So, yeah, purely based on that, it's a great opening. But the only thing I worry about is legs for this movie and how, like, I guess how well it can um, continue its run. And I'm I'm torn because I do believe this movie, it's it's controversial, and it shouldn't be controversial in my opinion because the movie has no political stance, but Americans love to be political and they're just really into it and extreme. Um, so they'll take, like, people are taking offense to this movie. So the controversy could make other people go and see it to see what all the talk's about or the, what the conversation really is all about. Um, or the, it can just be the negativity can just really wash over everyone and people don't want to waste their money going to go see this. It got a B minus cinema score, which isn't great, but it could be one of those ones or those, um, situations where it actually makes people go and see it because they just want to go see what all this fuss is about. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw the comment on our um, TikTok video. That guy, um, oh, he's like, oh, two NPC normies talking up uh, some program yes. media. I saw, uh, I saw that and I was and I was like, NPC, non-playing character? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's just like, oh. And then you go this into... The, a video game. Yeah, you go into his profile and it's like um, Canada has fallen. It's just like some political nut. Um, so Shout out to Canada has fallen. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it really depends on how people react to this. Yeah, it's hard to predict, you know, Americans and their politics. I, I hope that people can just like separate themselves from the movie. The movie is about war journalism and how, I guess, war um, dehumanizes you in a sense. So people can separate that. Then this movie should be able to have good solid legs, but like, clearly people aren't like that, um, which is fine. That's them, not me. Yeah, but what, what about you? What do you think about this being um, a huge header for A24? It actually did, ca- it did catch me by surprise. I mean, you know, mm. you've had bangs, like everything everywhere all at once, where it's more appealing to the mainstream sort of audience, mm. um, you know, just in regards to the super sci-fi sort of elements to yep. it. Um, this, I guess, is a little bit more niche. It's more A24-y um, in regards to it's based on a typical, uh, particular thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing much to grab someone, an audience towards apart from Civil War. Um, so I am glad it's doing really, really well because it's a fantastic film and it should be doing really, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did. The reason why it's doing so well is because we said to everyone to go see it and they clearly have listened <laughs> to us. <laughs> 
but no, it's it's good. Just the fact that it's gonna like absolutely smash um the opening weekend for A twenty four films as well is just mm-hmm. absolutely, absolutely insane. Yeah. So yeah, not nothing but positive things to say this. Um whether the word of mouth is good or controversial or negative, people are still putting their butts in seats to watch it. Mm. Really. Well, the highest grossing film uh, for A24 domestically is 77 million. That was everything everywhere all at once. And that just had so much positivity, really good legs. And then, you know, the Oscars came around the year after and I think they re-released it, got on more. Could it beat 77 million, you think? Given the divisive uh, reaction to this film? No, I, I don't think it can. Mm. I think it'll just leg out or like die out, die out. I don't think it has the legs in it. Yeah. I think it'll be relevant for a couple of weeks and then it'll just poof away. Yeah. Uh, the second one is Uncut Gems at 50 million. I think it's going to be close with that one, but it could definitely get to number two spot domestically. I'm really curious to see what uh, how international audiences react to this because it's, you know, it's centered around, you know, American politics and American civil war. Does the rest of the world really care about, you know, a film of this nature? That's That's really what I want to know. But I guess we'll That's find out. True. Um, That's true. You guys down below, mm-hmm. let us know. Down, down be- You guys down below. You guys watching, let <laughs> us know down below how well you think Civil War will go. And if you think it's a film that you want to go see multiple, multiple times, yeah, just head down, let us know. All right. Now we're going to quick, f- quick fire questionable questions. Or, no, quick, questionable, quick fire question. This is why it's James's segment. <laughs> it's, keep it's a tongue twister, flooding. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything. So pretty much here, I or James or we give each other the most ridiculous, stupidest scenarios in the movie industry. And we pretty much, you know, ask a question and then James will have to answer it. Whether seriously or non-seriously, it's completely up to him. <laughs> Um, I have shared my screen with James, and I hope you can see it. I can. It's my see first it. time sharing on a little screen. Oh, <laughs> awesome! That is great. All right, James, you can see what's in front of you. I'm sure you're thinking, "What the hell is happening?" And I'm sure you viewers will be able to see this as well. So the first question is: What would happen if Sherlock Holmes teamed up with Harry Potter to solve a magical murder mystery at Hogwarts? Oh gosh. Well, it would instantly be solved. You know, Sherlock Holmes <laughs> is doing his duty and he is the best. He doesn't care if magic so that he can see through any, you know, invisible enchantment or any kind of defense they do. He can just see right through that. He knows it. He can see everything. He's got that memory um, and he just notices every detail. And then you got Harry Potter uh, and what's he? He's the muscle to this. You know, if they come against some traps that... Sherlock Holmes needs to get through to really uncover this mystery. Harry Potter will go in there and destroy everything. He will make sure that Sherlock Holmes can ne- safely navigate this mystery and then they can find out what it is all about. And that would be a great movie. We need this crossover, honestly. Yeah. Uh, who, do who, do who do you think did the murder? I'm, I'm, I'm picking Draco. Nah, Draco's too obvious, and Draco is, he's a product of his parents, which is, its he's hes had a sad life. I'm going with Ron, you know, his son didn't make the Quidditch <laughs> team, is. and he gets angry and he goes on a murder spree through Hogwarts. That's a lot more believable, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Imagine a world where dinosaurs roam the streets of New York City. How would the original MCU Avengers handle this prehistoric situation? Oh, how would they handle it? I think they would they would team up, absolutely. They would be on the same team for this one. But I would say that they're all going to ride these dinosaurs into battle. Gives them a little bit more of force behind them. Makes them a little bit more terrifying. You know... Hulk is a he's a dinosaur in his own right, but imagine him on a T Rex coming at you. Those Chitari in New York City, man, they they're gonna go back up into their wormhole. They aren't they aren't coming down if there's dinosaurs here. You can the Avengers you might be able to beat, but with dinosaurs you just can't do it. And <laughs> unless the situation is where it's locusts um, instead of the dinosaurs, then that is when the Chitari <laughs> might actually dominate. Um, 
But yeah, no, I mean, this is just an unstoppable force. If, if Thanos saw what was on Earth and it was dinosaurs and Avengers, there'd be no Infinity War endgame. The endgame is the dinosaurs. So you're thinking the Avengers would befriend the dinos and bring them on their team? Oh, 100%, they would. And the dinosaurs would be on their team. I mean, just look at that dinosaur. He's, he, you know he's ready to team up with somebody. Set in his eyes. Imagine... <laughs> Imagine Cap riding a T-Rex into battle. Insane. Oh, it'd be too good. It'd be too good. It's just, it's unstoppable. It's just unstoppable. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Next one is, imagine a scenario where, (laughs) you're laughing already. So the minions from Despicable Me, they become secret agents and they are tasked with saving the world from a banana stealing thief villain. How do you think they would go, or how do you think their secret agentness would go in this situation? And do you think they'll be successful in completing their task of capturing this banana thief? Uh, no, I don't think that they wouldn't be successful at all. Not something like this. The minions aren't built to handle serious tasks. They're great um, backup sidekicks. They come through at, in, in an absolute emergency, but you can't put them in the lead. I know the Minions movies have made a lot of money, but you cannot put them in the lead. Not for something where the world's banana supply is at stake. You know, if the Minions are tasked and are becoming secret agents, we're going to run out of bananas, dude. This guy's going to steal everything. (laughs) And the Minions, what are the Minions going to do? You know, once this banana, banana, he's probably going to steal the Minions by accident. Look at them. They look like bananas. But yeah, no, honestly, the Minions don't stand a chance. Even if they come together as one big unit, all they're going to be doing is doing little fart sound and giggling and little punches to each other. No, don't make them secret agents. Do not put them in charge to save our banana supply. We need bananas. We need that potassium in our lives. Minions cannot save this. But do you not think that their love for bananas will be able to knuckle down and get the task because they also love bananas? No, not if they're not getting paid enough money. (laughs) <laughs> so Gru needs to start uh, emptying out his wallet a bit more. I still don't think they could do it. You know, the banana thief, I can see the picture right there. It's just, how do you stop that? You can't. I mean, this guy looks like as if he, like, carries a knife inside the peel. <laughs> just peel it back and stab you. <laughs> All right. Next question. Goody here. So what if Batman swapped places with Spider-Man for a day? How would Gotham City fare under Spidey's web-slinging protection? So we're, saying, we're talking about how Gotham would be under Spidey or how New York would be under Batman or both? Uh, Gotham under Spidey. How do you think Spider-Man will fare under the crime and corruption of Gotham City? Um, well, Gotham's crime would go in a day, I think. You know, Spider-Man's a lot more... <laughs> Uh, capable and stronger and better in every single way. Um, nah, no, no, not exactly. <laughs> Spider Man, I mean, people would laugh at him. They think he's goofy. You know that aesthetic, the the red and blue thing. People just wouldn't take it seriously. I think crime would have a massive boom, and then he starts actually like fighting and you know getting involved in like oh shit, like we cannot mess with this guy. This guy's legit. He's strong. He shoots webs. That's gross and, and weird. You know, I think crime would spike up massively, but then it would drop incredibly. But it really depends on what kind of, what version of Spider we get. Do we get this darkened one like Bruce Wayne or do we get the quippy one? I think that really determines everything at the, at the end of the day. Gotham's not a place for smiles. It's not a place for happiness. I think Peter Parker, a week in Gotham, I think he would go dark. I think he would be... You know, that really, the really darkened character who just doesn't have much inside him. And then does he get a little bit dark, a little bit feisty with his villains? If so, if he goes a little bit into that Bruce Wayne persona, I, I don't know. I think I think he would do really great things in terms of the crime just because everyone would be fearful of a dark Spidey. But if he's like goofy and like a little Deadpool guy, then yeah. Scarecrow's just going to have a field day with him. Yeah. Well, luckily they only swap in places for a day, so... I oh, guess we're yeah. Okay, for a day, for a day. 
I mean, I forgot about that part. That's some crucial information. <laughs> oh, if it's for a day, and if Spidey knew the task in front of him, he could do, he could do really good things, and far better than what Batman could. Next question. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> like that answer. <laughs> and the last question as well: in an alternate universe, Darth Vader and Thanos join forces and make an unlikely alliance. How would the galaxy tremble under these two juggernauts? Do the universes collide? As a like, is Star Wars in MCU? Uh, sure. Sure. Um. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't think Darth Vader is a formidable force. If he brings everything like the Empire and stuff, then then it gets a little bit scary. But Darth Vader on his own, he, how can he compare to Thanos? And if we're talking Infinity Gauntlet. Thanos is the one pictured here. You know, I, I, he's not that much of a threat. He's like a great. Um, what what is what are Thanos's um, guys like the Horsemen or um, his? Yeah, the four four Horsemen. Four Horsemen. I think that's Apocalypse, but yeah, I don't know what they're called. Um, yeah, he would just be another one of them. Honestly, like anyone could beat Darth Vader in the MCU. Well, not anyone, but like you know, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Spider Man. They could beat him um i think oh maybe even, even with his force abilities i mean he can just literally stop people with the force yeah but he, they're strong he can, he's strong as well he can still stop them and crush them could he crush them though i don't know probably i don't know we haven't seen much of like live action darth vader go just just insane um yeah i, I think oh mate he could probably be iron man that's because he could crush the metal on him. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about like the Avengers versus Darth Vader, it's a pretty easy contest in my opinion. Because um, he's very, he'd be very similar to that other Thanos guy. You know, the one who can telekinesis, he can move things um, in Infinity War. They, uh. Yeah, they beat him pretty easily. I think they could beat Darth Vader pretty, pretty easily. You know, just take the light, lightsaber off him. I mean, yeah. Iron Man would just make and a lot of what, what if he brings the Empire? I don't know. If he brings the Empire... I, I still think that they could be taken down. It's just an extra extra ally to Thanos. I mean, you look at Endgame. They had all the ships there. Captain Marvel just flew right all through the, all those ships. She could fly through us for a few more. Death Star, no problem. She'll fly right through that. She will just go from walk right in and throw that missile down into the chute where it destroys the Death Star. I don't think this is a problem for the Avengers, but Thanos, I mean, he's the formidable one. If they both had infinitely gauntlets, then, uh, yeah, it's game over. Universe is done. It's cooked, fried. <laughs> There's no <laughs> stopping that. <laughs> Definitely not. If they both had uh, infinity gauntlets, I would actually be shitting in my <laughs> pants, that's for sure. All right, guys, <clears throat> let us know what you think about the quick, questionable quick fire questions. I hate that title. I'm just going to call it QQQ whenever I do this. Um, if, you have it, if, you have any, <laughs> if you have any QQQ questions, uh, let us know down below and we might actually be able to bring it into life on our future potty. All right, so I mentioned earlier about saving your drinks. This is where we. I hope the sound captured that. I didn't hear it. <laughs> just in case it didn't. <laughs> This is when you crack open your cold one and we're getting into the main event of this podcast. And the main event is our top 10 DreamWorks animation films. Now, a top 10 is defined as James and I's favorites, not what we think is the best films, mm -hmm. our favorite films. Uh, obviously, one to 10, James will say his top 10 first mm -hmm. and then it's on to me. <clears throat> I say out my top 10 and then we will criticize each other of whether it's a good list or a bad list. I feel I'm going to get a bit criticized for some of my choices <laughs> here, but we'll have to wait and see. Hey, so you, James, might, you might get criticized. You might criticize mine as well. So That's true. Bad guys, number one. Let's go. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> but yes, remember, this is my favorite, guys. So if you have a problem with it, comment below. Tell me about it. I want to hear your favorites as well. But you can't really say it's wrong because it is my favorite. It's not your favorites. Um, yeah, and these are a mix of just things that I enjoy, things that I can rewatch easily, and are things that kind of mean a lot to me in a personal regard. Um, so I'll go through it. I guess we will start then, eh? All right. So top 10 Dreamwork, DreamWorks animation. We'll start off with 
10. So, name. I got The Croods, A New Age. <laughs> the second Croods. And I think this, uh, this primarily uh, goes back to our experience with the movie. I think it was a heavy COVID time, wasn't it, when this film came out? Um, to be honest, I completely forgot. This feels like 10 years ago to me. <laughs> But yeah, no, I think it was a COVID time. We hadn't really been to the movies that much. Me, Nan, Kyan, um, you know, we, we went to the screening. We didn't really expect much from it, but I think we arrived late and all we had was <laughs> the beds. Like, at the, I don't know if, uh, you, if you guys have like a cinema around you that have beds, but at the front of the cinema, there's beds. And we arrived, a, like, I think a couple minutes late to the screening. Every seat gone, just one bed between three of us. And we sat there and we watched it. And the movie itself, it's entertaining, it's fun. And we just had a ton of laughs. It brought a ton of memes between us. And it's just, it's left a really great memory um, for me in terms of just the movie itself being entertaining, but also that memory with the lads. So that's why it's number 10. I could not get rid of it, even though I did fight for some other movies to be on here. Uh, at number nine, I got Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted. Um, Madagascar franchises, I think it's a pretty uh, mid franchise. I think the movie, the movies are all good, but they're not great. None of them's really great. I would say Madagascar 3 is the best one from them. Um, and I think it, it just has a ton of, um, you know, really great uh, moments in it. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's the comedy works. I think it's probably, yeah, the best. It's my favorite. So there you go. Um, and number eight. We have Megamind. Um, yeah. People might not like Megamind, uh, maybe not after that TV show that released that came out to horrendous reviews, but Megamind the movie, I think it was just really good. It's about you know the villain becoming the hero um, with that story. And I mean, I just thought it was, it was just a really fun movie. I can, I've rewatched it maybe you know 10 to 15 times throughout my lifetime. I love the movie. It's just a ton of fun. And the comedy really, really works in that. At number seven, I got Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Another great memory with the lads. This is one where we came in and we did not expect much from this. In fact, I think me, Nan, and Kyan were all like a little bit hesitant to even come to that screening. You know, a Sunday morning, we're like, oh, okay, let's just go. Um, and so we went and I think all three of us are glad that we did because this movie turned out to be uh, a very surprising delight. It's super funny. There's so much memes between us three. Um, and the story itself is just good. However, I did watch it um, recently, and it's not as great as I remembered in terms of the movie quality itself, but I think the, one of the big pluses for this movie is the villain. The villain is um, terrifying. I absolutely love him. Mm. Um, we need more of that villain around. All right. Number six, Nayan. How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. So this hey. is the third one. Um, and I don't know how high or how highly regarded the third one is, but it's one that I like quite a lot. Um, in, in fact, the screening that I went to, it was like in the start of January and the movie came out at the end of Ma uh, March. And then the 20th Century Fox like president for New Zealand was like, oh, yeah, you're, by the way, you're the first in the world to see this. And we're like, whoa, okay. So that was an incredibly early screening, and I'm glad we were because this movie is really, really good. I think it caps off the trilogy really well. The departure between um, Hiccup and Toothless is just, it's emotional, it's well-meaning. I think it can easily be translated to real life about moving on, all that kind of stuff. So that one hit me deep in the feels, and it capped off a really, really great animated trilogy. Um, so I got it there. So that is my six to ten so far. Nayan, do you know where I'm going with my top five here? Do you think I know where I'm going? I definitely know your top three. I just don't know what in order. Yeah. Um, but I could be. I don't know what four and five could be. I'm looking at my own list. Oh, okay. I think I know about four. Okay. I know four. Four. In there. Interesting. All right. At number five, we have Kung Fu Panda 2. Um, <laughs> Kung Fu Panda 2 I've watched the Kung Fu Pandas very recently right before the fourth one um, and yeah Kung Fu Panda 2 is brilliant um, it's not as good as the first spoiler alert uh, for this list but it's not as good as the first one I think it just gets a little bit more goofier but it keeps that heart it keeps 
you know, those really powerful themes in it and it just it furthers Poe's character really well. Um, the comedy in it is still as good, not as great. Um, so, yeah, a really well done movie there. So number four, that goes to Kung Fu Panda now. Kung Fu Panda is brilliant. I think the comedy in that movie is, oh, it's got to be one of the best for an animated movie. It's hilariously funny. I've watched the movie so much and I rewatched it this year and I still laughed a ton. It's really, really, it's just done so well. And it's also quite meaningful to the character and his journey and how you can take away in our own lives. I think yeah, it's just, it's super, super well done. And there's a little bit more seriousness to it um, where Poe's not a complete idiot. Um, so yeah, it's got way more heart in it. All right, number three, how to train your dragon. The first one. Um, okay, so How to Train Your Dragon. I love this movie just so much. I think it's just, it's a really unique concept. It, it works so well. I love, you know, the animation, the relationship between Hiccup and Toothless and how that kind of comes. I think it has, you know, amazing, like, animation. Just the way it looks, man. Real visually well done. The score in it is incredible. Um, I listen to that one quite often. So, yeah. How to Train Your Dragon's really up there. It's just, I think, yeah, really a, a good feeling movie for me. And I think the top two are fairly obvious to name. I don't know about you guys listening, but at number two, I have Shrek 1. I mean, Shrek 1, I believe... I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Shrek... Oh, I swear, choked on my drink. <laughs> Shrek 1 is 23 this year. It's hard to believe that this is 23 because... I remember when this movie first came out in cinemas. Like, I remember being there, and I think I was, like, five. or well, five years old. I was five years old, and I still remember it. That's how, like, vivid th these Shrek movies are to me um, and how kind of meaningful they are to my life. I remember I remember getting really angry at mom. Like, I really want to see Lord of the Rings, man. I was like, no, I don't want to see Shrek. <laughs> what even is Shrek? Like, honestly, Lord of the Rings, that looks cool as. Um... And then we saw Shrek, and I'm like, oh, wow, that was so cool. Like, Shrek's just amazing. You know, it, it's super funny. It's creative in how it brings fairy tales into it. Um, just, you know, a ton, a ton of fun. Um, really great characters, you know, Donkey, Shrek, uh, Fiona. It all just works really, really well. It's endlessly rewatchable. A, a Shrek one, um, I might have watched this maybe at least 25 times, dude, like, in, in that time frame. It's just, yeah, it's so good. All right, number one. It's more, the than, one. more than once a year. Pardon? <laughs> what? More than once a year. Yeah, man. Like when it first came out, I watched it a few times, you know? <laughs> Being a kid and all that. All right, number one, Shrek 2. I mean, I'm sure you saw this one coming, man. You know my love for Shrek 2 is deep. It is great. I think it did better than the first one. Um, it's a better story. It expands the world far better. Um, you got far, far away. You got... All that stuff there. Puss some Boots gets introduced. It's a great, great character to have a part of it. But ultimately, it's 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 like, I don't know if it's more heartfelt than the first one, but the comedy is a lot better. It's a great, you know, action adventure that just keeps the same magic that Shrek had. I remember being in line, waiting in line um, in 2004 when it came out. I was so hyped for this one. I was not complaining to my dad to go see another movie because I had fallen in love with the Shrek movies. And I'm like, yeah, I want to see Shrek too. Um, but yeah, those two Shrek movies, man, they're just so good. They're so, um, I guess, they're meaningful to me and my, my childhood. We always have those movies that are quite you know, deep to us from when we're children, and, and Shrek is one of them. That's why when Shrek 5 does officially get announced, I don't know much movies that could beat it for number one most anticipated. I don't know. I can't <laughs> think of much examples. All right. Yeah, I will hand off. Very hard. Yeah, I'll hand off the baton to you now, mate. Um, you run through yours, critique mine. Yeah, you're fully gonna get triggered over mine. Eh? Oh, really? <laughs> oh, but this God. is favorites. So favorites can be wrong. That's true, and nah. I think number ten's gonna be wrong. All right. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Number ten is Shark Tale. I can get it's behind that. Smith. That's all right. Jack Black one. Yeah. I just remember, I think it was early teens when I was in intermediate. So that's 11, 12, mm -hmm. um, 13 years old for you Americans that don't know what <laughs> yeah, 12. intermediate is. Yeah. Um, 
I, it was one of the th- films I always used to watch. You know, my dad got it on, I think, DVD back then. <clears throat> and it was like the first DVD I had. And mm-hmm. obviously I could play it on my OG Xbox. So that's all I was doing, you know, <laughs> big square Xbox. Yeah. So that and Back to the Future were pretty much the two films... Mm-hmm. I was just rewatching consistently on the <laughs> Xbox, and I just came to love Shark Tale. Like, if I watched it now, I'd probably think Shark Tale is a piece of shit. Uh, but one thing I do remember about it is that the comedy was fantastic. I, as a little kid, I was just pissing myself laughing, <laughs> and I really liked the voice chemistry between Will Smith and Jack Black. Mm. I think they were absolutely hilarious together. So that mm. is why it's my number ten. More personal, similar to your Crudes one as well. How is a bit more personal? Yeah. Personable. Yeah. Yeah. Right, my number nine is How to Train Your Dragon Hidden World, the third one. Mm-hmm. Um, you capped it off nicely. You know, it's probably the How to Train Your Dragon franchise is probably one of the best franchises ever made. Mm-hmm. I feel every trilogy nowadays is getting into that status, and it just goes to show how good quality films are being made. Mm-hmm. And this is one of them, especially from an animated standpoint. And you touched upon it before, you know, the the relationship between Hiccup and Toothless. Uh, mm-hmm. They went through in the first two movies, and how this one resulted is similar to you and I, you know, yeah. how I had to let you go over to Australia. <laughs> so that would make me hiccup in this situation, oh. you toothless. <laughs> and, yeah. and then, and then your partner is a white dragon. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. Yeah. yeah it <laughs> so yeah. Oh, didn't even I think like about it. it. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. It. <laughs> Getting emotional now. <laughs> <laughs> number eight is How to Train Your Dragon number two. Oh. I think this is an absolute fantastic sequel to the first one. Mm. Um, and it had a massive emotional moment that, you know, when you watched it, you just were like, I haven't seen something this emotional since Lion King, you know? Mm. Like, it's very rare that you get this sort of stuff in anime animated films, unless it picks up. Um, yep. So, yeah. That was one of my big things, um, and especially Toothless coming up against like a formidable villain as well. So, mm-hmm. but for main one for me is just that emotional moment. Can I spoil it? No, I won't spoil it. It's just yeah, that emotional. Oh, movie, bro! You can spoil it. Oh uh, yeah, H- Hiccup's dad dies. Yeah, uh, and he also like f- finds his mother as well, and then his. Um, father died so he found his parent that he's searching for and then his parent that he knew for his whole life ended up dying so that was just like fuck yeah <laughs> poor <it's>... kid <laughs> all right number seven is mega mind oh wow <laughs> didn't you Chucked just rewatch it for the or like you watched for the first time recently i feel like i remember you telling me one day like oh yeah i watched me one for the first time no, not for the first time. I rewatched it for the first time in a long time. Oh right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I th- yeah. I think, I think I watched it like twenty twenty one, and that was my first time seeing it since it came out. Oh right, and yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Love it. It's great. It's <laughs> a meme for a reason, you know. It's so good. I don't. Is Sasha Baron Cohen the voice actor for Mega Mind? Can't remember. Is it? Oh, I can't. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah. like. When I remember when rewatching it, it was a very similar sort of tale to The Incredibles, you know, like mm. a younger superhero looking up towards someone and then eventually turning bad and then the bad guy or good guy turns bad. Yeah. You know, so th- they have that similarities, except Mega Mind wasn't afraid to, you know, just make a fool of himself and mm-hmm. try be as angry and villainous as possible when deep down he's a good guy no comments from you i'm <laughs> sure you're no oh i know exactly a person that's like that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah mega Miner is in at number seven number six is how to train your dragon the first one mm. that one you know it started all it started the probably one of the greatest animated franchise ever next mm-hmm. toy story um it's right there um it's a fantastic story of a guy wanting to make change within his own culture Mm -hmm. um, and how they perceive a particular creature and this creature just struggling to trust a human after all they do do to his creatures and they eventually come together and win over the entire Mm -hmm. tribe city village the tribe top village tribe Tribe, yeah (laughs) community (laughs) <laughs> and they all just fall in love with dragons and see them as friends, not foes. So mm. it's just a real good story, pretty much told in an hour and a half as well, which is really, really rare. 
Number five is Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my 4K version so I can rewatch it. They're at Amazon, you keep damaging it. <laughs> ordered it twice, so <laughs> don't damage it the third time. I'm waiting. I want to watch it again. Um, you said, especially now after that you said that you rewatched it and it wasn't as good as you first thought. Mm. So that that's another reason why I want to really rewatch it now. But yeah. that first time, you know, like that wasn't, we didn't go see a kid's film. We saw a horror. <laughs> the kids were, the kids we watched in the cinema with were literally screaming in fear. And you, sometimes it gets annoying, but in this time it just elevated the movie got an experience because James Kine and I were screaming in fear <laughs> over the wolf. Like that dude is scary. This film is literally carried by that one bloody stupid wolf. And the dog, because at before the film, we have a thing called the Nay, and James and Kyan were both like, Nay and his death's the dog. And I was like, why the dog for? Like, that's like the most obvious stupid one. And I was like, it is. We watched the film, and there's a, there's scenes of him wanting to rub his belly. There's a scene, scene of him just absolutely like swearing, but it's all censored out. And then after the movie, I was like, yeah, yeah I am. That's it. me. That's me. <laughs> rub belly for good luck. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Number four is another childhood one of mine. Um, there's a viewer over in the UK that would appreciate this because this is a meme between him and I, and he was with me whenever we watched this, and that's the first Madagascar. I uh, really, really love yeah. that film. You know, you said that the second one was probably the best. Oh, the third one's third one. the best one out of the yeah. three. <clears throat> I, I have the opposite view. I think the mm -hmm. original is just the best, you know, just in terms of the zoo animals getting exposed to the wildlife for the first time and then mm -hmm. just pretty much their relationship group just absolutely going chaotic and breaking down. <laughs> it created so many memes within my family and um, friend group as well in regards to, you know, mm -hmm. Maurice and stuff like that. Like we would just quote it every time we hung out together, yeah. we'd watch this and then go do something else. Yep. So yeah, this one is a real big personal one of mine and that's why it's in at number four. So no judgments. Yeah. <laughs> number three is Shrek 2. Oh God. So you pretty... <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> So you touched upon it before. It was really, really great. I mean, how do you capture the magic of the first Shrek? And that's mm -hmm. by bringing in the fairy godmother and Prince Charming. Oh, and every, everything from there is amazing. You know, even the, the soundtrack is amazing from, mm -hmm. I think the song's called I Need, Need a Hero at the end of the third act. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Shrek wanting to become more human so he can relate to Fiona mm -hmm. a bit more as well. And just everything about that film is fantastic so it's probably a great sequel probably one of the best sequels of all time as well yeah number two is kung fu panda the first one i just love that movie so mm -hmm. much i find yeah. it so funny i think jack black is great and it's probably the one film that makes me crave dumplings every single time i watch <laughs> it i probably watched it four or five times five out of five times i have to go get dumplings <laughs> after the day after and i have to re-watch it <clears throat> before i watch the fourth one gonna get some dumplings from one ahead of the game gonna get some dumplings while i watch nice yeah, i just find it i find it absolutely fantastic and just how the story of like pretty much a nobody or like mm -hmm. you know someone that you wouldn't think to be the superhero or this the chosen one becoming the chosen one him doubting himself and then eventually you know saying that yeah i can do this job and i can do it yeah um and rising to the oh shit drop my pen <laughs> and rising rising to the occasion you know is just awesome there is no secret ingredient, bro. It's just you. It's what's inside of you. Russell Uguay, man. That guy's a bloody G. I love he's, that character had, so much. Yeah. He had a screen time for like five minutes, and it's just oh. the most wisdom I've ever heard in my life, you know? <laughs> God, that guy is just goated. He's so Make good. him a knight. Make him a knight already. Like, first animated character to become a knight. Sir Uguay. Sir Master Uguay. <laughs> Sounds good, too. And at number one is your number two shrek for me i mean you know who's whose house is it it's shrek's <laughs> when it comes to dreamworks he's yep. the one that really put dream dreamworks on the map and mm -hmm. stuff like that and look what the shrek franchise has spawned you know memes <laughs>, laughs yeah. five four films and spin-off films as well mm -hmm. like the soundtrack to it is absolutely fantastic Shrek is me, you are donkey for obvious reasons. Uh, it's just, you know, like, yeah. so you can just make memes out of anything. You know? <laughs> it's just great. And like yeah. the 
the character dynamic between both Shrek and Donkey is quite underappreciated sometimes. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the best, um, you know, relationships in animated films or films together. They might not like each other or they might get annoyed, but they still like there for each other. At yeah. Every single time, no mm-hmm. matter what. Yeah. And it's just yeah, full of laughs, Smash Mouth. You know. Yeah. Oh, how can you beat Shrek? So iconic. So iconic. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> any comments on my list? Oh, off your list. Um, yeah, Shrek 2 being 3 is criminal. Criminal. <laughs> There's no way that that movie deserves to be that low. Um, I mean, generous. Kung Kung Fu Panda, it's great. It's, it's not, not better than Shrek 2. Um, so, I mean, favorite. I mean, that. Yeah, I know, I know it's favorite, <laughs> but if I was in doing it. Um, I didn't, yeah, so I didn't really expect Kung Fu Panda to beat Shrek, so I thought Shrek 1 and 2 would be at the top, but I mean, still top 3 at least. Um, yeah, but now everything's just kind of in line with what I thought. I know you'd have Puss in Boots High, the Kung Fu Panda. I'm surprised Kung Fu Panda 2 never made it. Um, only one Kung Fu Panda, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was doing the list, and originally it was like Shrek 1, 2, Kung Fu Panda 1, 2, 3, and then... How to Train Your Dragon, one, two, three. And I was mm. like, nah, this can't mm. be it. So I actually like <laughs> looked at it properly and I was like, oh, I don't, I remember Kung Fu Panda 2, but I don't remember it well enough. Right, so, right. So yeah. I ended up leaving. So that that's the way I worked through those films. It's like, I know it should be here, but I just don't remember enough to like give a justifiable or a justifiable reason. Right. And explain it. Yeah. So I had to get rid of it. No, but, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, the last, I debated having Madagascar on mine, the first one, because I do love that movie, but I just couldn't put it above, like, Crudes or anything like that. It was just, yeah, it was too hard. Kung Fu Panda 3 was considered, Over the Hedge was a big one that I wanted oh, in there. I was thinking, yeah. I was also considering the Road to El Dorado as well. Yes, I wrote that one down well. too, yeah. I, like I wrote that one down, I wrote that one down, and, and then I was about to join the podcast, and I was like, why do I need to say it? Like, I know it's a great film, but I can't mm. explain it well enough because I haven't seen it in ages. Yeah. So I had to get rid of it. That was my <laughs> exact reasoning too. I'm like, I know I love the movie. I just can't, yeah, I haven't seen it in like, like decades. So yeah, yeah. I couldn't put it down because I couldn't speak on it really. Um, and I really yeah. hope DreamWorks gets on the 4K bandwagon. I'd love to see Madagascar and Kung Fu Panda. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got um, How to Train Your Dragon, but even Shrek, just the whole series coming out in 4K. Yeah, Shrek one has, I, th- I think, Shrek 2, they might do it for the 20th anniversary. Just drop it all at once, man. Come on. I know. But it needs to come out this year then because it's the 20th anniversary for it. Oh, they just need to get, they just need to do it. I have the first Shrek on 4K still, but I wouldn't do the second one at least. I don't really care about the third or fourth one that much. I knew they wouldn't be on your list. But it's How to Train Your Dragon. It's the entire trilogy on your list. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's impressive. Yeah. yeah. But no, besides Shrek 2 being at third, no major quarrels. <laughs> I'm happy for Shark Tower. I'm glad the bad guys didn't make it. All is well <laughs> with me, lad. It was a bit of a fight for that number 10 spot between Sharky and the bads. I don't know if you're being serious or not. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I was like, when I put Shark Tower, I was like, I'm either going to get roasted or, he, or he's going to agree. And you <laughs> agreed. I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah. It's all, all right. That's our top 10 dreamworks animated films let us know what you think about our top 10s individually in the comments below and be sure to drop your top 10s as well we'd like to know and uh see what you think of whether shrek 2 should be at three or it should be at number one like james let us know all right that will do us on the let's be real podcast for today hope you've all enjoyed today's fun little show uh, if you want to watch more, head over to YouTube, click on our channel at Movie Games, and be sure to hit that thumbs up for the like for all of our videos and that subscribe button as well. We would appreciate it a lot. And if you want to hear us rather than see us, I understand, head over to Spotify or wherever you pod from and just look, listen to us, you know, we, and our, the mayhem we get into over there. And be sure to let us know about any uh, any topic you want us to discover, uh, mm. discuss any games you want us to play, any questions for QQQ that you want us to answer, head over to Instagram or X at Movie Games and let us know. Thanks, everyone. Tune in next time. We're Movie Games. See you later. Peace.